yes thank you is. anaga for that great introduction and i like to thank my my good friend dr murli and uh, chitra madam for inviting me for this uh, very exciting webinar uh, and murli has nicely put it as nuts and bolts of uh, brown syndrome management uh, so what is brown syndrome basically what are the recent concepts uh, this Can was put it on presentation by, mode uh, presentation mode play i should slide do. show slide show slide show can you yeah it's coming like this only is yeah it's all right now it's okay yeah yeah uh uh brown syndrome which was recently uh, this theory was proposed by dr brodsky who uh, thought that the brown syndrome may be a part of uh, congenital cranial degeneration syndrome where they found that it was abnormal development of trochlear nerve axon which eventually causes uh, abnormal development of the superior oblique muscle tendon trochlea because most of the patients when they image they found most some of these superior obliques were uh, thinned out so they thought that it's a lax or an absent tendon and possibly an hypoplastic muscle so some of these patient develop congenital superior oblique palsy and because of this uh, uh, abnormal development of the trochlea which is basically a cartilage in the eye uh and which causes the restricted tendon and a possibly hypoplastic muscle combined uh they put forward it as congenital brown syndrome kushner thought that in patients with brown syndrome mostly the superior oblique is the tight muscle which which is at fault and there is possibly a bursa which is present in the trochlea and this bursa can also cause an impediment of the movement of the superior oblique when it passes through the trochlea ಮಗು ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಹೇಗೆ ಹೋಗ್ಬೇಕು ವಾಟ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಸುನೀಲ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಲೈಡ್ಸ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಗೋ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಮಿನಿಮೈಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ run it as a minimize yeah. as a non projection uh, slide shashikant sometimes it just okay. gets uh, okay uh, uh, i was thank to dr allen speeman for this excellent slide uh, and this again proves that there might be a, a abnormal synkinesis between the lps and the superior oblique muscle so as we see in this in this slide where on dextro on levo elevation there was a limitation of the right eye and in the primary gaze the eye is ortho and when the patient tries to look in uh, levo depression there is uh, some amount of lid retraction which is occurring on in levo depression suggesting that might be a fourth now lps synkinesis and which might be a cause which might be related to uh, aberrant innervation or that might be a genetic causes which might be leading it leading to lid retraction but there are other causes proposed by dr kushner and dr stephen craft who felt that uh, Uh, there might be a uh, the superior oblique the frenulum which connects the uh, superior oblique with the superior rectus might have become also tight which also may cause a lid retraction when the patient tries to look down uh this is a very interesting case uh, which we published in uh, journal of american academy of pediatric ophthalmology strabismus as you can see in the primary case there is a small hypo in the left eye the patient presented very early and the parents were very sure that the, this syndrome has uh, this uh, abnormal movements of the eye started recently and uh, we looked at the fast uh, the fat scan there's a family album tomography scan which revealed that the child was abso- abno- absolutely normal and uh, if the child tries to look up you can see the v pattern which occurs the the possibility of causes of v pattern are two one was proposed as the the since the inferior oblique is normal in this patient and the eye is not able to elevate beyond the midline because the tight superior oblique the eyeball abducts causing a v pattern and the second proposed mechanism is the the eye being slipping under a tight superior oblique muscle causing a v pattern so what for this patient was uh we did uh, give intratrochlear 1 ml that is 4 mg of betamethasone into the intratrochlear area uh, uh 
and and we first we pro we did a forced action uh, degeneration test of Guyton. Uh, we confirmed Brown syndrome, and then we gave the uh, 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 this uh, intratrochlear uh, be uh, beta hematosome that is four milligram of one ml into the intratrochlear area. There's a very good improvement one month post op, and you can see in this photograph uh, there was a good improvement of the head posture in this child. Uh, and this is again a very interesting case. What we had uh, this patient presented with the uh, head tilt to the left side, and she had an injury with the uh, her. Signal strength is not good. I think there are some connectivity issues with uh, Shashikan. I think, yes. Uh, can, uh, okay, Shashikan? can you call him and uh, in the meantime, could we move on? I guess. Uh, can we have a few questions uh, till, we, till he comes back? Uh, yeah. Yeah. A okay. few audience questions. So, uh, any of the expert panels or uh, speakers can respond. Uh, so, this question was for Dr. Rohit. For paralytic uh, diplopia, is there any role of ocular uh, paralytic muscle exercise? So, any, any role for exercises in uh, paralytic strabismus? Uh, one of the audience questions. So, uh, acute uh, muscle palsy. Although I don't uh, directly give exercises, but I usually would ask the patient to patch the better eye. Uh, at home in familiar surroundings, although uh, the impact is controversial, but it would act by uh, preventing contracture of the antagonist because uh, when the eye attempts to look in the direction of the paralyzed muscle, there is inhibition of the antagonist. So that constant, uh, you know, chance of going into fibrosis and contracture may be, although there is no, uh, I would say, a uh, Clear oh, evidence to it, but I would I always prefer to patch. Oh, on internet, but uh, Dr. Saxena, yeah. uh, but Dr. Rohit, sometimes that effort can, can make now? the patient really? a bit nauseous also. Uh, I, yeah, I've seen people absolutely nauseous. in the initial period. This yes. happens more in the initial period because the eye hand coordination is still not you know kind of uh, developed. So. I tell them that when you're home and you are in your familiar surroundings and you're doing you know, work which you're comfortable with and you patch your normal eye and if diplopia is troublesome and you're going out, then you patch the affected eye. Okay. So yeah. that, that's the I use and I mean, and like I said, there's no clear evidence on that, but uh, I would say for want of anything better. You can see my slides. Yes, we, uh, no, we can't see your slides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, Jessica. Yeah, actually, this uh, this uh, this girl presented to us uh, after an injury with her brother's knee to her uh, right eye, and she had a head tilt to the left side. Uh, there was no facial asymmetry in this child, and uh, when we looked into her uh, extraocular movements, we saw there was limitation of her right eye in uh, elevation, and there was a limitation of her right eye in levo depression. And when the patient underwent a CT scan, we showed a, a, a blowout fracture of the medial wall with the entrapment of the superior oblique muscle. And so we came to a diagnosis of uh, canine tooth syndrome, where there was a coexistence of superior oblique palsy along with the Brown syndrome. And what we did was a microsurgical release of the superior oblique muscle by uh, Dr. Usha Kim, madam. And after the surgery, we can see there's a very good improvement for elevation of the right eye in uh, levo elevation, as well as the depression had vastly improved. This was an again an interesting patient who presented to us, and the father was very sure that the child had strabismus. And see, he said that some days the child is normal, and the some child, some days uh, she developed uh, uh, some sort of abnormal eye movements. And when we examined this patient, those extracular movements were looking absolutely fine. Uh, there was no limitation of movements in any of the eyes. And when, then we said, no, everything is fine. But he was very sure that, that there was limitation of movement on some days. So we told him that if the child develops strabismus, then you should bring the child to us for an examination. And while, uh, what do we see in this slide? Uh, we saw there was a limitation of the left eye 
on elevation and uh, and there was a, a b pattern strabismus we could we could not have done the we didn't do the exaggerated four section test since it was a child and but looking at the findings we came to a diagnosis of cyclical or intermittent brown syndrome and then we looked into the literature into this uh, into this type of presentation and then we came across one of the cases which has been published and it was showed that there was an enlargement of the bursa which is present on the trochlear fossa which is and when the child sleeps there is some edema which occurs because of the accumulation of fluid and that causes the enlargement of the bursa and that causes the limitation of elevation of that eye leading to brown syndrome as the day progresses the edema resolves and the brown syndrome resolves and when we did the uh, scan in this child we found everything was normal we could not image the trochlear uh, thing because it requires very high resolution and may require a surface coils uh this is again a one more interesting patient which we had as you can notice in this patient the patient had a limitation of elish the right eye and there was a, a b pattern strabismus and the parents were uh, the child was little uh, had problem looking in up gaze he was complaining of diplopia in the up gaze so we thought we'll do an exaggerated four section test in the opd itself and what do we see immediately after the four section test you could see the improvement of the elevation in the right eye just so like a magic what you had done and the patient was absolutely free and the double vision had gone and when we we compared we did a hs chart pre and post brown we just we thought we'll do a, a pre brown syndrome hs chart and then we saw, saw a lot of improvement in the moment uh, uh, improvement in the moment of the eye so this four section uh, for fdgt that is a four section guidance test it's a very good test which we can relieve brown syndrome especially in patient present with acquired browns so what is the medical management observe some of these patients may get better with observation we rarely see congenital brown syndrome in adults most of them presents with acquired browns so what actually happens to this brown syndrome they resolve over a period of time some of these patients may get better with prisms you don't have to do any surgery for these patients FDGT we are proposing as a treatment for acquired brown syndrome intratrochlear steroids can be kept an option for acquired brown syndrome surgical management superior oblique tenotomy which was earlier done which caused lot of superior oblique palsies in many of these patients can be combined with inferior oblique resection to take care of the torsion and the hyper which develops uh, following superior oblique tenotomy chicken suture is one of the proposed mechanisms for brown syndrome and split tendon lengthening is one of a preferred procedure which it causes less amount of uh, weakening of the uh, superior oblique muscle and we have seen very less less amount of patient developing superior oblique palsy this is a very interesting patient who presented 60 seconds uh, left it, uh, we did a, a brown we did a spacer in the left eye for brown syndrome at the age of 7 years in the patient presents to us after 5 years presenting with the left superior oblique palsy we can see the left hyper and a small exo and then we proceeded with the right inferior oblique recession but this patient if you look in careful in the down gaze patient has a uniform left eye hyper we suggest that patient may have a superior oblique palsy with the additions of the uh, the spacer to the scleral uh, to the sclera we had to release the additions as well as uh, and we did a simultaneous interrectus recession the other eye and what do you see this patient now presents 10 years later after the after the second surgery so 15 years follow for this patient and now the patient has a very small hyper in the left eye and is uh, he is good and there is no diplopia except when he looks down gaze and then we proceeded with proceeded with the automated test chart and we did the automated binocular fields and when you look at his automated head chart we could see the limitation uniform limitation in his uh, left eye and it is uh, and we did the automated binocular fields and then we could see there's a good improvement in his binocular field, except uh, in the down gaze which is which is good because 30 degree is is there was no double vision for this patient so brown syndrome what you're proposing congenital acquired mri depends on the fat scan the family album tomography 
the blood investigation depending on the type of brown syndrome it's acquired brown syndrome then we can do esr uh, rheumatoid factor test the ana anti nuclear antibody test and then proceed with an mri and in acquired brown syndrome we have to give intratrochlear steroids we give as early as possible we don't wait so and uh, uh, post duction degeneration test we can keep it as a post duction of guidance test we can keep it as a treatment modality prisms and surgery the last thank you